The Beginnings and Origins of Freemasonry The Masonic movement initially entails secrecy not only in its organization but also in the secret foundations. It also implies the secret of power over the spiritual world, the elements of nature, over humanity, and social principles. Such a unique concept is characterized by the inclusion of opposite worlds. Biblical images and concepts coexist freely with representatives of the anti-Christian world. Masons themselves often present themselves as a fraternal organization aimed at promoting virtue in society. For example, the Grand Lodge in Massachusetts describes Freemasonry as a society that unites the efforts and abilities of its members for individual self-expression, study, and initiation of others into the art of living and character building. Many Masonic publications state that lodges are wholly dedicated to the principles of fraternal love, assistance, and truth. Freemasonry is a totalitarian cult, a secret society, a pyramid structured like a network marketing system. Masons of lower degrees do not have complete information about the goals and objectives of this society. Those who are initiated directly into higher degrees bypass all the nuances of this multi-layered brotherhood and become instant generals. Freemasonry is a totalitarian sect. The highest stake in it is human life. They manipulate on a large scale, entire nations are at stake, and the fate of these nations does not concern modern puppeteers. The emergence of Masonic lodges and orders is closely linked to the flourishing of medieval church construction in England, France, and Germany. Construction guilds, mainly involved in the construction of churches and monasteries, began to unite into various unions to develop regulations and protect guild interests. During the heyday of church architecture in the 11th to 12th centuries, the power of the monastic brotherhood, which held a monopoly on construction, was clearly insufficient. Lay builders, who were called upon to help, also organized themselves into fraternal corporations, following the example of monastic fraternities. The historical roots of such construction institutes date back to ancient times, during the reign of the Egyptian pharaohs. The enormous constructions of that era required highly educated specialist builders who learned under the guidance of Egyptian priests. Undoubtedly, there was an internal spiritual connection between the unions of builders, their leaders, and teachers. The teachings of Egyptian priests were characterized by unity and a systematic structure. However, there is very little information available about the organizational structure of the priestly union. Usually, the initiates did not disclose this to anyone. Based on indirect evidence from some Greek thinkers who studied under the Egyptians, it can be inferred that there was a multi-tiered system of initiation into the secrets of the craft and teachings. The power of the spiritual forces behind the Egyptian priests is evidenced by their contest with Moses, or rather, with the Creator, Exodus, Chapter 8. By analogy with Egypt, the architects of Christian structures in medieval Europe were usually representatives of the clergy from Benedictine and Cistercian monasteries. They also formed regulations that regulated the rules of coexistence necessary for long-term fruitful work. After all, the construction of one object often lasted for decades. Such construction fraternities thrived until, due to the decline of the bishops and abbots, they distanced themselves from construction, considering it too lowly for their rank, and completely handed it over to laymen. Meanwhile, the ambitious self-consciousness of the cities demanded to perpetuate the flourishing of power and prosperity, emphasizing their particular piety. 
architects of urban temples were skilled citizens who received education in monastic schools. They soon abandoned the religious forms and traditions that were foreign to them and began embodying their own national ideas in church construction. The pinnacle of architectural art was reached during the era of Gothic architecture. Originating in France in the late Middle Ages, Gothic architecture spread throughout Western Europe. The convergence of numerous construction guilds and massive contracts required strict discipline and order. Moreover, the complexity of Gothic architecture, with its abundance of stone carving, ornamental decorations, stained glass, and other elements, demanded high craftsmanship and significant professional training from the builders. They not only needed specific technical skills, but also had to be creative individuals. Such skills could only be acquired within a specific architectural school. Builders found value in preserving the secrets of their craftsmanship as they created their own architectural masterpieces. By joining closed corporations, they gained the necessary education which was passed on as professional secrets. By the end of the 13th century, Germany alone had 22 stonemason guilds. Later, they gathered for a special congress and solemnly adopted the statutes of the German Builders Guild. The Strasbourg Stonemason Guild, in 1273, among other privileges, obtained judicial authority over its members. Documents related to construction guilds in England date back to the beginning of the 13th century. The statutes of some English construction guilds from 1388 included biblical and mythological figures such as Abraham, David, Solomon, Hermes, and Nimrod as well as the names of renowned ancient mathematicians. In England, alongside guild fraternities, there were also building lodges, which included not only builders but also members of other aristocratic social formations. The term Freemasons, adopted by the members of these lodges, appeared in Acts as early as 1350. Initially, the word lodge referred to a special secluded place where stone was processed and prepared for construction. A group of builders regularly gathering in a specific location for secret of communication. The value of architectural and construction knowledge, special techniques, and trade secrets, as well as the distinctiveness of cult structures erected by free stonemasons, naturally led them to contemplate a special mission and proudly motivated them to keep their secrets hidden from the uninitiated. Such professional secrecy bestowed a special importance upon the corporations, granting them privileges and independence from state and church institutions. Consequently, within these closed communities, their own legislative and spiritual moral principles naturally evolved. These principles were shaped by their own, non-ecclesiastical, interpretation of the Bible and the influence of various religious and mystical teachings of the Middle Ages. The Masons continued to read the Bible, which had been taken away from the laity by the church at that time. They lived in isolated communities, usually in special barracks located near the construction site. The master was the senior figure in the barracks. He would read, if capable, and interpret the Bible, dispense justice, and directly address production and daily matters. The architect, who led the Brotherhood of Construction Workers, provided overall guidance in construction and acted as a mediator between the client and the workers. All production and daily relations were regulated by strict rules of the Brotherhood. 
violators were shamefully expelled from society and could not work in the profession for the rest of their lives. No guild had the right to employ them. The rules of the Brotherhood also required that new inexperienced workers be trained in the secrets of the craft for at least five years. This training was conducted under the guidance of experienced journeymen. Then one of them, usually familiar with the candidate for membership, recommended the latter to be accepted as a mason. On a predetermined day, the candidate had to perform a special initiation ceremony into the masonry. Unarmed, blindfolded, bared chest, and left foot bare, he would knock on the door of the hall three times. The member of the Brotherhood who met him would lead the initiate to the master, who would order him to kneel and recite a prayer. After that, the initiate had to perform other special ceremonies, take an oath on the Gospel or the Brotherhood book, which lay on the table along with the tools of the craft, the square and compass. The oath of loyalty included a promise to keep the lodge's secret and not reveal it under the threat of death, otherwise, let his throat be cut, and in the afterlife, he shall receive a worthy share of hellish torments and curses. After that, the candidate's blindfold was removed, a new apron was put on him, and the password was communicated. Finally, he was taught a special handshake welcoming words, a call for help, and other secrets of the Brotherhood. Usually, such a ritual concluded with a fraternal feast. Adorned with hermetic symbolism, the Masons always recognized their brethren in dialogue, serving as a password. To the question of a brother from another lodge, are you a Mason? The answer would follow. Yes, I am one of them. How can I know that? By the signs and traces of my initiation into the craft, from there into the church, and from there into hell, the candidate would eloquently respond. Subsequently, when being accepted into another guild, even in a foreign country, knowledge of the password and symbolism would assist the mason in finding work and obtaining necessary assistance. The symbolic language used within the Mason fraternity was a natural reflection of the mythical spirit of the Middle Ages. Therefore, it is not surprising that the principles of such a seemingly simple and mundane craft as construction inherited the occult, hermetic symbolism of pagan priests. Certainly, in such ceremonies, there was a lot of theatrical buffoonery. However, there is no doubt that behind the apparent pomp, engaged in by quite serious people, there were real forces attempting to determine and control the lives of the initiates. Since there are no neutral spiritual forces in nature, it is undoubtedly the forces of darkness. The divine spiritual realm does not engage in jest and cheap trickery. With the onset of the Reformation era and the replacement of the Gothic architectural style by the Renaissance, the working conditions of construction workers also changed. The hierarchical oppression and scholastic pressure were replaced by the era of enlightenment and humanism. With such an epical upheaval, the guilds of Freemasons began to decline and disintegrate. Due to military conflicts, political and territorial disputes, the construction guilds were finally abolished by the King's Decree in Germany in 1731. However, they continued to exist in secret. With the decline of the guilds of Freemasons, their rich emblematic and spiritual heritage could not remain unused. For a certain fee, Individuals from privileged social strata began to join the lodges. Aristocrats, attracted by the external pomp of false symbolism, refined Masonic rituals, 
introducing secular extravagance and grandeur into them. The proud, freedom-loving spirit of enlightenment humanists rejected the burden of any traditions and aspired to the progressive triumph of thought, universal freedom, equality, and brotherhood. Rejecting the Creator who demanded personal repentance and the biblical concept of universal sinfulness, the Enlightenment thinkers sought to embody their ideas in essentially symbolic religion. They found such an opportunity in the construction unions of Masons, their orders, and brotherhoods. Borrowing the form, Masonic thinkers, speculating on mystery and ritual, infused it with new content. Freemasonry represents a center of unity and creates a close community among people who would otherwise never be close to each other. George Schuster, History of Secret Societies Masons claim that they are not a secret organization. However, there is much more information in libraries than ordinary members of their fraternity know. In other words, like many other totalitarian religious sects, widespread ignorance and limited horizons prevail here. Perhaps the most original theory of the origin of Masons was put forward by John Robinson in his book Born in Blood, where he claims that the roots of Freemasonry go back to the times of persecutions and crackdowns on the Knights Templar by Pope Clement V. After being banned by a papal bull in the early 14th century, the surviving Templars, who evaded arrest, went underground. This explains the all-encompassing mystery characteristic of Freemasons, Although part of the heterogeneous Brotherhood of Freemasons rejects the ambitious claims of the Templar successors and considers them mere speculative fabrications. The beginning of modern Freemasonry is considered to be the year 1717 when, as a result of the union of four related English lodges, the Grand Lodge was organized with the task of spreading the ideas of symbolic and humanistic Freemasonry. Initially influenced by the spiritual realm and discovering something new, the ideologists of Freemasonry imagined themselves as the arbiters of the fate of the rest of the unenlightened humanity. In an altered state of consciousness, they were completely unaware that they had fallen into a banal trap for simpletons and had become a cult dependent. In this state, they sought to make their fellow brethren the same. Templars To strengthen their lineage, modern Freemasons associate their past with well-known Christian orders and mystical movements, the history of which is subject to varying interpretations. One of the most famous and controversial movements is the Militant Order of the Templars. It is believed that one branch of the Masons traces its origins back to the order founded in 1118 by nine French knights in Jerusalem. They named their brotherhood the Order of the Poor Knights of Christ. King Baldwin II granted them part of his palace, located near the Temple Church, and they received a new name, the Temple's Army. Initially, the Templars lived in great poverty. But soon, many knights joined the order, and powerful rulers endowed it with numerous possessions. The annual income of the order amounted to 112 million francs. After the capture of Jerusalem by Muslims, the Templars' headquarters were moved to Paris. The powerful Christian order turned into a vast international bank and aspired to global dominion. The Templars' temples housed countless treasures. Monarchs and wealthy nobles entrusted their valuables to their protection and borrowed money from them. Now the wealth and power of the order raised concerns among many rulers. The Templars' holdings were scattered all over the world 
and rumors spread that they sought universal domination. Numerous accusations were brought against the order, which had become excessively rich. In 1307, the French King Philip the Fair ordered the arrest of the Grand Master of the Order, Jacques de Molay. Several thousand knights of the order and their assistants were also arrested. The main accusation against the Templars was that they allegedly did not recognize Christ as the Savior, the Holy Spirit, and the Saints. During initiation into the order, they spit on and trampled the cross and wore an idol's image on their bodies beneath the nightly cross. They worshipped this idol in a dark cave. The idol's name was Baphomet. Additionally, the Templars were accused of other crimes. Under torture, many knights confessed to the crimes attributed to them, some died without saying anything, and others took their own lives. The trial lasted for several years and spread to other countries. Hundreds of knights were burned at the stake. Jacques de Molay spent over five years in prison, and then he suffered the same fate death by fire. The confessions extracted through violence or a thirst for revenge may not be given much importance. One thing is clear, the Knights of the Temple's army had something special and inaccessible to other mortals in their resolutions, beliefs, and rituals, which differed from the rituals and ceremonies of other religious military societies. Prolonged stay in the East, in Palestine, filled with Greek schismatics and heretics expelled from Constantinople, who sought refuge among the Arabs, rivalry with the Hospitallers, encounters with the Saracens, and ultimately the loss of the Holy Land, all of these factors together made their lives appear idle in the eyes of those around them. These and many other circumstances had an unforeseen impact on the Order. Rituals and ideas were introduced into the Order that were incompatible with its original intent and even contradicted it. In the name of the Order, there was a claim to rebellious ambition. The term temple is a more general concept than church, it stands as if above it. The knights of the temple could consider themselves priests not of some transient religion, but confessors of a true secret truth unknown to the uninitiated. Their legends about the Temple of Solomon served as a connection to the rituals of Freemasons and other secret societies. At the time of their initiation into the Order, the Templars absorbed many sectarian and heretical traditions of the period of search for the Holy Grail, the mystical cup with the blood of the Savior. During their time in the East, the Knights became acquainted with the doctrines of the Gnostics and Manichaeans. This is sufficiently evidenced by the Gnostic and Kabbalistic symbols found in the tombs and gravestones of the Knights Templar. Thus, it was a secret heresy, and according to some writers, it implied an opposition to Roman Catholicism, just as the immense wealth of the sectarians was the cause of their condemnation by the Roman Curia. Most researchers agree that, like all heretics of that time, the Gnostics, the Cathars, the Templars professed dualism. They acknowledged the existence of an upper god, the creator of the spirit and goodness, and a lower god, the creator of matter and evil. Like all dualists, they denied the divinity of Jesus Christ. Since they considered the upper God inaccessible to humans, the entire cult was related only to the lower God, in whose jurisdiction all earthly matters supposedly resided. Initiations were conducted as they progressed toward a higher degree of knowledge. According to some information, 
The revelations of each new level refuted all previously acquired knowledge. The highest degree revealed the identity of heaven and hell, the meaninglessness of good and evil, and the essence of virtue and unconditional obedience to the spiritual Lord. Rosicrucians The Rosicrucians are associated with the spiritual leaders of modern Freemasonry, who are engaged in its ideological aspect. While the lower degrees of Freemasonry somehow reconcile with Christianity, after attaining the rank of the Rose and Cross, Christianity appears to be the primary adversary of Freemasonry. Here, a complete substitution of concepts takes place, and the rationality of the Freemasons is blocked. The supernatural demonic world is presented to the Masons as divine, while the divine spiritual world is demonized, and an uncompromising war is declared against it until the victorious end. The Rosicrucians emerged in Germany during a turning point in history when practical science was born, shedding the mystical cobwebs. True scholars, abandoning esoteric alchemy, dedicated themselves entirely to scientific activities. Swindlers and mystifiers joined the ranks of the criminal world. A former Catholic priest, Louis Constant conversed with the famous mystics of his time, Vronsky and bulwer lytton Louis Constant's major work, Fundamentals of Magic, covered experiences with black magic, Kabbalah, and witchcraft practices, and soon became a textbook for the occult. Following the instructions of his mentor, occultist alchemists established the Order of the Rosicrucians, which became a true academy of Satanism and spread its influence to other countries. Understanding that alchemy as a science had been completely discredited, the Rosicrucians hastily sought to abandon the tainted name of their alchemist ancestors. However, they cleverly utilized the ritual and emblematic heritage of their predecessors. By spiritualizing and purifying the mercantile alchemical idea of gold production, the heirs of the pagan priests attempted to combine witchcraft rituals with the search for philosophical truth. The newly emerged secret order arose in 1614 to 1615. Works were published about the mythical founder of the Brotherhood, Christian Rosenkreutz, to dignify it. According to legend, similar to the founders of other mystical fraternities, the founder of the Rosicrucians also gained access to higher wisdom through initiation in the East, in a mysterious and inaccessible corner of the world. As the Hermetic Society spread throughout the world, it eventually transformed into one of the Masonic Lodges. This final transformation occurred in England, where the German Brethren relocated. In the late 18th century, English Freemasons absorbed the Rosicrucian Brotherhood, which had branches in Bristol, Manchester, Cambridge, Oxford, Edinburgh, and Glasgow. In Freemasonry, the symbolism of the Rosenkreuzers was transformed and became synonymous with symbols of spiritual perfection. Now in its confessions, the renewed order seeks to know God through communion with nature. Using the emblematics of traditional Christianity, however, the Rosenkreuzers gave it their own semantic meaning. For example, they interpreted the acronym INRI, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, as Igni Natura Regenerando Integral, nature renewed by a reviving flame. The degrees of initiation of the Rosenkreuzers are rooted in the distant past. Incorporating the heritage of the Gnostic sects, claiming the crosses of chivalry, the lodges are based on an ascending ladder of sacraments. 
For the alchemist, each rung represented a certain degree of deed. For the astrologer, the zodiacal planetary idea. For the Kabbalist, Sephiroth, the basic elements of the doctrine. For Freemason, degrees or grades. The system, as we can see, is similar. At some stage, most likely in the 20s of the 17th century, when the order was organizationally formed, its structure became more complex, acquiring the character of Proto-Masonic and at the same time emphasized Hermetic. A Hermetic community or Hermetic order is a secret and initiatory fraternity that is engaged in the study and practice of the occult and esoteric teachings. Illuminates this order directly connected with Freemasonry claims a special role as the fundamental, guiding, controlling and decisive force of all parties, religions and movements. Many of the ideas of the Enlightened Order have been incorporated into Communist, Socialist and other party ideologies. The Order of the Illuminati, Enlightened, was founded by Adam Weishaupt a young German law professor. Early bereft of his father, he began studying in a Jesuit grammar school from the age of eight. The dogmatism and dullness of teaching from childhood instilled in him an aversion to the faith, which he identified with his teachers. Barely 15 years old, Weishaupt entered the University of Ingolstadt which was dominated by the same soul as scholasticism. At the age of 20, he said, he could only prove the truth of his faith by asserting that this is what the church says. Gifted, possessed of a tireless ambition, the young graduate obtained early a doctorate and then a professorship in canon law and natural law at his native university. At the institution he soon found himself embroiled in intrigues between supporters of his godfather, the reformer Adam Mikstadt, on the one hand, and secret supporters of the Jesuits, on the other. Trying to find an outlet for his immeasurable ambition, the young professor seeks a foothold outside the walls of the institute. His tireless search soon led him to the Masons, and in 1774 he became a member of the Strict Obedience Lodge, Karl Theodor Zumguten Rat in Munich. Within two years he had passed through all the stages of initiation. Disappointed in the emptiness of the inner content of Masonic initiations, Weishaupt came to the idea of creating his own secret society. He saw it as really capable of improving people and transforming the whole world. The ultimate goal of the new society was a general bloodless revolution and the establishment of a golden age on earth. The implacable enemy of his former Jesuit mentors, Weisskopf successfully adopted their tactical and disciplinary methods. He was fascinated by the teacher's ability to use a wide range of means to achieve their goals. In principle, not only in his own behavior but also in the statutes of the society he created, he embedded the postulate, the end justifies the means. Extreme indiscriminateness in means and a vain desire for absolute dominance did not adorn him or make him attractive. The thorough Jesuit education and acquaintance with Masonic lodges inspired the ambitious scholar to create a society for the reformation of the world. However, Weisskopf and his supporters were not revolutionaries. They envisioned a difficult, centuries-long work of enlightening and self-improving humanity, which would ultimately reach the kingdom of reason and virtue. Weisskopf believed that the members of the society should be enterprising, cunning, and insinuating people. Seek, above all, the noble, powerful, and wealthy. 
the ideal convert becomes a skillful, diligent, sociable person, and if he is also rich, noble, and influential even better. The program of the new secret society, drafted by the initiator himself, consisted of the following, all members of this society must spread their influence imperceptibly and without visible insistence on people of all classes, nationalities, and religions. They must cultivate the mind in a certain direction, but it must be done in deep silence and with all possible energy. It is necessary to make our principles fashionable so that young writers propagate them in society and thus, unwittingly, serve our cause. It is also necessary to acquire the allegiance of passionate minds to passionately preach the common interests of humanity. Each of us must commit to informing our superiors about positions, services, benefits, and other honors that we can dispose of or obtain through recommendations so that our superiors have the opportunity to fill these positions with worthy members of our order, serving as their support in order to subtly transform the surrounding world. It is necessary to surround the strong of this world with a legion of tireless individuals who direct the affairs according to the order's purpose. Bind the hands of all those who resist, destroy, and crush evil at its roots. Crush all those whom you cannot convince. After long searches, the society was given the name Illuminati, Enlightened Ones. Its establishment was chosen on May 1, 1776, and subsequently, this day became an international holiday of solidarity for all workers. Initially, the society consisted of only nine people, but after three years, it already had four branches in different cities in Bavaria. Organizational assimilation of like-minded Masonic lodges allowed the movement to expand through the involvement of many influential individuals. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Johann Gottfried Herder, Duke Charles Augustus, Mozart, and other well-known figures of their time belonged to the Order of the Illuminati. Soon, the Order had lodges not only in Austria and Hungary but also in Poland, the Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden, Italy, Spain, and Switzerland. The movement attracted thousands of new members. Its followers adhered to a strict educational program, reaching new heights through the comprehension of increasingly complex ideas. A wall of mystery was built around the activities of the order. Only the members of the Areopagus leadership knew that Spartacus Weishaupt, was the leader of the movement while other lodge members also concealed their identities under resonant pseudonyms. The meeting places of the lodges were kept in strict secrecy. Practicing the tactics of the Jesuits, the Illuminati spied on and informed on each other. In 1794, when the Duke Karl Theodore seized power in Bavaria, he immediately banned all unauthorized societies. During a search of one of the Illuminati, incriminating papers were discovered, treatises justifying suicide and documents exposing the head of the order for forcing his partner to have an abortion. At that time, such facts were more than enough to initiate criminal proceedings. The disgraced professor immediately left his homeland in secret. After the scandalous exposure of the attempted global conspiracy, the Order of the Illuminati disappeared from view for almost a century, until the democratic revolutionaries of the 19th century succeeded in reviving Weishaupt's cause, inspiring it with renewed revolutionary ideas. Once revived, the Illuminati spread throughout Germany, Austria-Hungary, France, 
Russia, and America. According to some information, they are currently active in almost all countries of the world. The deliberate concealment of the true purpose and goal of creating orders proves to be a convenient means of hiding the pretentious plans of their founders. The identity of names often conceals vastly different real meanings. Members of the society Old Crows in California spend their free time playing out scenarios of nuclear war. The Sovereign Military Order of the Temple of Jerusalem, the Sovereign Order of the Solar Temple, the Order of Knights of France, many of these orders were established with the help and under the direct influence of Freemasons. Although it is unlikely that the majority of vain simpletons who are members of these societies understand where they have ended up and where they will be led next. After all, earthly greatness quickly passes. Playing on the simple curiosity of ordinary people, exploiting wounded pride, exaggerated self-awareness, and the thirst for glory, the adepts of these societies have always attracted collaborators to themselves. The world has never lacked such human material for the construction and realization of the most odious plans. Obviously, the hype created around mystical orders is the best advertisement for their activities. The noble Freemasonry for the select few is subtly preached and many of the intellectual elite accept it. Perhaps not even aware of the ideas, having been sold for green papers, they become hostages of Satan and are forced to be mere doers in yet another round of history. Sermons of outright Satanism, theosophy, and occult worldviews are masked for the time being. In the lower lodges and numerous promasonic organizations, tolerance for Christianity and people in general is claimed. The promoter of theosophical views, Rurik, whose ideas are popular today, advises taking lessons in tactical lying from the founder of the Rosenkreuzer Order. According to legend, upon returning from India to Europe, Christian Rosenkreuzer had to teach the teachings of the East in a semi-Christian guise in order to protect his students from persecution. Today, hundreds of famous and tens of thousands of lesser-known writers, journalists, businessmen and showbiz stars freely implement Adam Weishaupt's ideas into their lives. Among Weishaupt's followers are showbiz stars, famous singers, actors and directors, artists and entertainers, social engineers, and secret service workers. It is unlikely that these people have any idea of what awaits them and whose puppets they are. In every single country, with the silent consent of the corrupt authorities, they have enough admirers and imitators. Thus, through education, mass media and youth culture, a certain way of life is introduced, and a new type of personality is formed as a consumer of all the ideological garbage produced by highly educated social engineers and distributed through Hollywood and other ideological institutions of our time. Gary Ka, who worked in the U.S. government in Illinois and had access to secret documents and personal acquaintance with the heads of global governmental organizations, writes in his personal famous study of Freemasonry and the globalization associated with it. When I became convinced that Freemasonry was closely related to Theosophy, and therefore to the New Age movement, I decided to learn more about the Masonic organization itself by researching its origins, purposes, and beliefs. To delve more deeply into the matter, I spoke with many current and former Masons, eight of whom had reached the 32nd or 33rd degree. From these conversations I learned that most people joined the Lodge under pressure from other Freemasons or in the name of camaraderie. 
Many of them became members in the hope that it would raise their social status and help them advance in their careers, since most of the leading businessmen and government employees are Freemasons. The order gives them an opportunity to enter the elite of society on this point, former and present members of the Lodge were unanimous. But that is where the similarities between the two end. The stories of today's Masons were radically different from those of those who came out of the order. The former did not show that they knew anything about the higher, religious, purposes of the organization. They were strongly devoted to the Lodge and told me that Freemasonry was nothing but an international secret charitable community. Former members of the Lodge, for their part, expressed opposing views. They informed me that the organization was anti-Christian and dangerous, especially at its higher levels. The ex-Masons explained that this was the main reason for their withdrawal, adding that it was inspired by Lucifer. I could not understand the reason for such a huge difference between the opinions of former and present Masons. One conclusion was that present-day Freemasons do not want to reveal the true face of their organization either because of their oaths of secrecy or because they do not really know anything about it, since they have not yet reached a level that allows them to see the hidden purpose behind the activities of their order. Perhaps the most important factor working for Freemasonry is that more than 3 million American Freemasons think of it as a noble and virtuous society. At the same time, they are usually unaware of its hidden agenda, whereas they should know more about the secret order to which they blindly pledged allegiance when they joined it. Something about the internal structure of Masonry Freemasonry consists of members of lodges organized into a system of ascending stages, grades, degrees. With the higher the level, the more it narrows, the fewer members make it up, according to the principle of the pyramid. The base of the pyramid consists of the societies of apprentices, who support the superior societies of comrades, who in turn support the masters, and so on up to the top of the Masonic Hierarchical Pyramid. Within the sequence of these degrees, there are a number of secret localized conspiratorial societies. The structure of Freemasonry's organization is identical to the scheme of its influence on the world. Masons of lower degrees can only act under the guidance, most often unspoken, of brothers of higher degrees. From the moment they join the fraternity, they are surrounded by experienced Masons, who among themselves form other secret societies, entry to which lower degree Masons are forbidden. Thus the whole pyramid is controlled, the will from above, being transformed, is transmitted to the uninitiated world in the form of democratic ideas of freedom, equality, fraternity. The transition of a member of a lodge from one level to a higher one is accompanied by a ritual of initiation. The elevation, of course, means a more privileged position, a higher status of trust of the top and a greater involvement, dedication, in the secrets of the doctrine. The ritual of initiation is a theatrical production, a mystery, the term of the Freemasons themselves, the protagonist of which is the candidate, the initiate, or initiated, to join the Lodge or to pass to the highest degree. It must be said that the term ritual, right, may also refer to a separate hierarchical structure of a Masonic organization, such as an order. The latter of the Masonic hierarchy has goals, to recruit newcomers and convince them of the noble aims of Freemasonry, to select from among them men of sufficient conviction and wealth, to finally initiate them into the secrets of their activities, to organize, 
order and direct the ritual toward a known goal according to temporal circumstances. Not all who wish to join Freemasonry enter, but only those whom Freemasonry recruits for itself. People who are well-to-do or who have influence in politics and society are invited. Lodges must carefully avoid the initiation of profanes who cannot bear the expenses of society. Section 258 of the Statute of Public Ordinances of French Freemasonry. When a society, lodge, receives notice from its member that a known person agrees to accept an initiation, it asks the recommended person what good he can do for the society. Only then do the leaders consent and send letters of summons to other members to attend the initiation ceremony. Perhaps 90% of Freemasons themselves do not know and do not understand the true objectives and ultimate goals of their organization. They are a cover for the actions of certain forces. For many, most likely for the absolute majority, participation in hermetic symbolized rites is a tribute to tradition. This is how the whole pyramid is controlled the wool from above, being transformed, is transmitted to the uninitiated world in the form of democratic ideas of freedom, equality, fraternity. But if Freemasonry is so harmless, as its propagandists try to present it to us, then why are the belonging of the world's strongmen to this or other secret organizations so carefully concealed and veiled? Many writers and readers do not understand the logic of the actions of the Freemasons. Some, based on historical facts, write that businessmen Freemasons actually created the USSR and it is not clear why they financed Nazi Germany, others, in some way informed authors try to veil the past and write that Freemasons were the winners in World War II and thanks to their actions spread world peace. Although everyone knows that, like other secret societies, Freemasonry has different levels of its doctrinal teachings. To the outside world it is exoteric, that is, open, and to the inside world it is esoteric and encoded in various symbols. Often the highest level of initiation completely refutes the previous teachings of the lowest level. The end.